Introduction This is a thrilling story about how an unidentified guy hijacked a plane, scored a $200,000 cash ransom, and then bailed out with a parachute from 10,000 feet up, never to be seen again. On Wednesday, November 24, 1971, right before Thanksgiving in the U.S., a middle-aged dude with a black briefcase walked up to the ticket counter at Portland Airport and bought a one-way ticket to Seattle on Flight 305. He called himself Dan Cooper. On the plane, he took seat 18 coulombs at the back, lit up a cigarette, and ordered a bourbon and soda. Yeah, those were the good old days when you could smoke on a plane. Though, I bet not everyone was cool with it. Cooper was probably sipping his bourbon just for kicks, not to calm any nerves. Why do I think that? You'll find out later. Later on, flight attendants Tina McClough and Florence Schaffner described Cooper as a guy in his 40s, about 6 feet tall, weighing between 170 to 180 pounds. He was wearing a light black coat, loafers, a dark shoe, a white shirt with a collar, a black tie with a clip, and a mother of pearl tie pin. He had brown eyes set close together and a swarthy complexion. The note and the bomb flight 305 took off from the airport at 2.50 p.m. The plane was only a third full. Excluding Cooper and the crew, there were 36 passengers on board. Right after takeoff, Cooper passed a note to flight attendant Florence Schaffner, who was sitting closest to him. She thought Cooper was just giving her his phone number, so she didn't read it and just slipped the note into her pocket. Talk about an arrogant flight attendant, huh? But okay, I get it. She was probably pretty and used to guys hitting on her all the time, but Cooper wasn't trying to hit on her. He leaned in closer and said, Miss, you might want to look at that note. I have a bomb. The note basically said, I have a bomb in my briefcase. I'll use it if I have to. I want you to sit next to me. After reading the note, Schaffner sat next to Cooper and he showed her the bomb in his briefcase. Then the hijacker asked the flight attendant to pass on his demands to the pilots. He wanted $200,000 in a Mark 20s, two sets of parachutes, and a refuel when they landed in Seattle. Schaffner relayed Cooper's instructions to the pilots in the cockpit. Pilot William Scott got in touch with Seattle Tacoma Airport. To avoid causing a panic among the other passengers, they were told that the landing was delayed due to technical issues. The head of Northwest Orient Airlines, Donald Naira, decided to give in to the hijacker's demands and told his staff to follow through. The plane had to circle over Puget Sound for two hours to give the Seattle cops and the FBI enough time to gather the parachutes and ransom money for Cooper. Cooper knew the area like the back of his hand. He recognized Tacoma when they flew over it and even correctly mentioned that there was an Air Force base about 20 minutes drive from Seattle Tacoma Airport. According to flight attendant Schaffner and another stewardess, Tina McClough, he was super chill, confident, and polite. McClough even admitted that Cooper seemed kinda charming in the way he acted. After making his demands, Cooper ordered another bourbon and water and paid his drink tab in full. That's why I say the guy was drinking for pleasure. The FBI agents rounded up the ransom money from several Seattle banks, then thousand in Mark $20 bills, most of which had serial numbers starting with the letter L. That letter meant that these bills were issued by the Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and were from certain series. The Seattle police got some civilian parachutes from a local skydiving school. Passenger release At 5.24 p.m., the hijacker was informed that his demands had been met. He allowed the pilots to land the plane at Seattle Tacoma Airport. Flight 305 touched down at 5.39 p.m. Then Cooper ordered the pilots to taxi the plane to a remote area and turn off the cabin lights to prevent snipers from seeing inside. Cooper demanded that the Seattle Air Traffic Control send someone with the money and four parachutes to the plane unaccompanied. An employee delivered the cash and parachutes through a door in the tail of the plane. After that, Cooper released all the passengers, Schaffner, and another flight attendant, Alice Hancock. Crazy plan. While the plane was refueling, Cooper laid out his flight plan to the crew. Had southeast towards Mexico at the lowest possible speed, about 115 miles per hour. The maximum altitude 10,000 feet. 
The co-pilot, William Radichak, explained to Cooper that the plane's range was calculated for 1,000 miles, which meant they would still need another refueling before entering Mexican airspace. Cooper and the crew eventually agreed to land for refueling in Reno, Nevada. The FBI was totally stumped by Cooper's plans and his request for four parachutes, cause that meant he might have had an accomplice on board. At the same time, it kinda made you think he was planning to bail with one of the hostages. And now, I'm gonna tell you probably the most crucial thing about this whole crazy situation up until then. No one had ever tried to jump out of a hijacked commercial plane with a parachute. Whoever this dude was, he either had some serious guts or he just didn't give a damn about his own life. Did he make it after that jump? Stay tuned. While they were fueling the plane, some official wanted to lay out what was waiting for the skyjacker, went up to the plane's door and asked Cooper if he could come on board. Cooper was like, no way. The hijacker got all suspicious, cause the refueling was still not done after 15 minutes. There were legit technical reasons for it, but Cooper threatened to blow up the plane. That got the fuel guys to finish up the refueling real quick. Jumping into the unknown, after opening the rear door of the plane and extending the stairs, Cooper ordered the pilot to take off. Around 7.40 p.m., the plane took off. During the ascent, Cooper asked flight attendant Tina McClough to go into the cockpit and close the door behind her. As she left, McClough noticed Cooper was tying something around his waist. He was probably securing the money back to himself. At the same time, two F-106 fighter jets were scrambled from a military base and flew behind the plane in such a way that Cooper couldn't see them through the windows. In total, five military aircraft were tracking the Boeing 727-51. Around 8 o'clock, a warning light in the cockpit indicated that the aft air stair had been activated. The crew asked Cooper over the plane's intercom if he needed any help, to which Cooper sharply declined. Soon after, the crew noticed a change in air pressure, signaling that the aft door had been opened. At approximately 8.14 p.m., the tail section of the plane suddenly pitched upward, forcing the crew to quickly stabilize the aircraft. By 10.15 p.m., the plane landed at Reno Airport with the aft stair still deployed. FBI agents, state police, sheriff's deputies, and Reno police surrounded the plane, as it was not yet confirmed that Cooper was no longer on board, but a search quickly confirmed his absence. From that moment on, Cooper was never seen again. Investigation. Inside and out. When the FBI searched the plane, they found 66 unidentified fingerprints, Cooper's tie, a tie clip, and cigarette butts. But then, mysteriously, the cigarette butts disappeared from the case files. Cooper took one of the two parachutes, picking the oldest main chute and a non-functional reserve. If Cooper was a pro skydiver like some thought, he would have known the reserve was a dud. But he didn't notice go figure. The FBI guessed Cooper used cords from another chute to strap the cash to himself. Pilots from all five planes tailing the Boeing didn't see Cooper jump because of the bad visibility from the storm and clouds. The F-106 fighters escorting the plane didn't spot the jump either. The FBI figured Cooper bailed at 8.13 p.m. when the plane's tail went up, probably because the air stair got weighed down by Cooper. At that moment, the plane was flying over the Lewis River in Washington state. Pinpointing Cooper's exact landing spot was super tough because of different estimates on the plane's speed and the surrounding conditions. The big unknown was how long Cooper was in free fall. The suspected landing zone was near Merwin Lake, in the mountains about 30 miles north of Portland. Searches in that area turned up such. Later research suggested the landing zone might be southeast, near the Washougal River. But again, nothing was found. It's believed that the 1980 eruption of Mount St. Helens could have destroyed any physical evidence. The serial numbers of the stolen bills were circulated among banks and casinos all over America. But none of them ever turned up. Investigation. What happened after the jump? As I've mentioned before, the FBI eventually dismissed the theory that Cooper had any real skydiving skills. From a professional standpoint, Cooper's jump was basically suicide. It was November, and outside the plane, the wind chill was minus 10 degrees Celsius. But Cooper jumped wearing just a business chute and loafers, with an old parachute and a non-functional reserve. Even if Cooper survived the jump, surviving alone in the mountains at that time of year would have been impossible without a ground accomplice. But even with an accomplice, the jump was suicidal. It was late evening. The plane was flying over uninhabited terrain with no bright lights, which meant Cooper was jumping into the unknown. 
Basically, the FBI thought Cooper didn't survive a fall and they looked for him among the state's missing persons from that period. But they didn't find anyone. In 2020, Viktor Zabolotsky, a distinguished Soviet test pilot, told the newspaper Komsomolskaya Pravda that from a professional standpoint, Cooper could have very well survived the jump. Investigation. Who is D.B. Cooper? Originally, a guy named D.B. Cooper from Oregon was suspected, but he was quickly ruled out. However, a local reporter named James Long, in a rush to get the story out, got it mixed up and called the hijacker D.B. Cooper, a name that other media outlets immediately picked up, and that's how Cooper became known in history. Just to remind you, the hijacker actually introduced himself as Dan Cooper. The FBI created a composite sketch of Cooper based on witness statements. In 2011, new witness accounts were published that refined the description of Cooper's appearance. Neither Cooper, the stolen money, nor any other items were ever found. A letter from Cooper. Three weeks after the hijacking, the Los Angeles Times received a letter in which the author stated that he wasn't Robin Hood and explained that he had only 14 months to live, and hijacking the plane was a quick and profitable way to provide for himself during that time. He didn't consider his act romantic or heroic and wasn't seeking heroism, understanding the risks of his action. He said he wasn't a psychopath, as he hadn't even received a ticket in his life. I'd argue with that last point, we know plenty of psychopaths who behave decently in social life. However, many doubted that the letter was actually written by Cooper and thought it might have been a prankster. The first suspect is Richard McCoy. He was the most famous candidate for being Cooper. McCoy was an army vet who served two tours in Vietnam, first as a demolitions expert and then as a chopper pilot. In April 1972, just five months after Cooper's jump, the FBI busted Richard McCoy for hijacking a plane in a way that was super similar. When you look closer, McCoy's heist was a lot like Cooper's gig. McCoy hijacked a plane and bailed out with a parachute, just like Cooper. He jumped from the re-rear stair of a Boeing 727, the same plane Cooper used. McCoy pulled off the same kind of stunt, just like Cooper. McCoy asked for four parachutes and kept his cool during the heist. Both dudes handed the flight attendants notes claiming there was a bomb on board. Even though McCoy kinda masked the sketch, the FBI ruled him out because he was younger than Cooper and his skydiving skills were better. Plus, they proved that on the day of the hijacking, McCoy was in Vegas, and the next day, he was back home celebrating Thanksgiving with his family. The second suspect. The second known candidate for the role of Cooper was Wayne Weber. A World War II veteran, he served time in prison from 1945 to 1968 for theft and forgery. Before he died in 1995, he confessed to his wife that he was Dan Cooper. But at the time, she didn't know anything about the Cooper case. She learned about the plane hijacking from a friend months after her husband's death. In the library, she found a book about Cooper and discovered notes in the margins written in handwriting similar to her husband's. Circumstantial evidence that Weber could have been Cooper includes his love for bourbon, a knee injury from a plane jump, constant mentions in his sleep of a re-rare stare, and a trip to the Columbia River, where later some of the Cooper ransom money was found. However, in 1998, the FBI officially ruled him out as a suspect due to a negative DNA test result. The third suspect was Kenneth Christensen, a former employee at Northwest Orient Airlines, the same company that owned the Boeing plane hijacked by Cooper. Kenneth had paratrooper training and served in the Army until 1954. His brother Lyle suggested in 2003 that Kenneth could be the hijacker Dan Cooper after comparing the composite sketch of Cooper to his brother's appearance. Kenneth was a smoker, enjoyed bourbon, and bought a house shortly after the hijacking. Lyle tried but failed to get the FBI interested in his suspicions. In 2007, Florence Schaffner, who had interacted with Cooper, couldn't positively identify Christensen as Cooper, although she said he looked a lot like him. After that, Lyle turned to a private investigator, who published a book in 2010 claiming Christensen was Cooper. However, it later turned out that Kenneth had bought the house on a mortgage, and his savings came from selling land. Cooper's tie. The tie Cooper left on the plane before he jumped was thoroughly examined by teams of scientists. Scientist Tom K put together a whole research team to study this tie. Using an electron microscope, they found over 100,000 particles on Cooper's tie. There were chemicals like cerium, strontium sulfide, and pure titanium. And here's where it gets really interesting. 
K explained that these elements are considered rare earths and are used in very specialized fields. Back in 71, these elements were pretty rare, but they were used by Boeing, which at the time was developing a supersonic transport plane. And as you remember, it was a Boeing plane that Cooper hijacked. The presence of these rare materials on Cooper's tie might suggest that he worked at Boeing, maybe as an engineer or a manager at one of the plants. Conclusion Cooper's case is still a mystery that captivates minds. As of 2011, the FBI's file was 40 feet long and covered over 1,000 suspects. The case was open for 45 years before the FBI finally closed it in 2016, although they're still open to hearing new leads. They also concluded that if Cooper is ever found, he'll be brought to trial. Maybe you were the one who saw a guy perish shooting through the sky on November 24, 1971. If so, give the cops a call.